A pleasant good evening, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure on behalf of the Caribbean School of Medical Sciences, Jamaica, as we host our first inaugural public lecture. And this is our first inaugural public lecture. And it comes on the heels of 2022 by our own chancellor, Professor Earl Spencer Taylor. Certainly, the accolades of Professor Taylor are many, but we have an able presenter who will introduce our chancellor. The topic for this evening, future of medical and healthcare training and delivery and temptations to avoid. A perspective on current trends, certainly a topical issue, and welcome to persons in our virtual audience. We thank you for joining us as we have our first inaugural public lecture. At this time, I wish to introduce Ms. Akima Stennett, our Vice President of Student Guild, who will introduce our able speaker and chancellor, Professor Taylor. Professor Earl Taylor, Chancellor of the Caribbean School of Medical Sciences, Jamaica. Dr. Neville Graham, Dean of the Caribbean School of Medical Sciences, Jamaica. Dr. Milton Hardy, Dean of Medical Sciences. Mrs. Cassie Jean Graham Davis, Master of Ceremony and Board Secretary. Other members of the board, those joining us online and in person, good evening. A 1967 CAST graduate, 1971 UWE graduate, Professor Earl Taylor is a Jamaican founder president of the Graduate Institute for Leadership and Professional Development, Center for Management and Productivity, and Management and Financial Innovations Incorporated in Namibia. A registered professional engineer, fellow and life member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer, USA, Fellow of Ghana Institution of Engineers, former Vice President of the Jamaica Association of Engineers, Fellow of the New York Academy of Sciences, Fellow of the International Energy Foundation, a Distinguished Fellow of the World Economic Forum, Vice Chancellor, International University of Management, Namibia, Commonwealth Advisor to the Government of Namibia, Lesotho and Swaziland on Science, Technology and Research, 1997 to 2000, with concurrent appointment as Professor of Entrepreneurship, Strategic Management and Public Policy. University of the Namibia Chairman, Namibia Center for Public Service Training, and Special Advisor to the Office of the President, Office of the Prime Minister Namibia, and Chief Resource Person for the SADC Parliamentary Forum on Leadership Development, Diplomatic, and Parliamentary Training. As forerunner, Professor Taylor served the UN system for over 12 years at director level in New York, Vienna, and Geneva, and country posting for the World Bank, UNDP, UNIDO, and WTO. In Jamaica, he served as group managing director of one of Jamaica's largest conglomerates, comprising electrical manufacturers, Jamaica Limited, Capella Lighting and Metal Industries, Jamaica Limited, Eagle Electric Caribbean Limited, and for four years was Vice President of the Jamaica Manufacturers Association, and concurrently Chairman of the Scientific Research Council of Jamaica. The Food Technology Institute, National Tool and Dye Company, Board Director of Jamaica Development Bank, Board Director of the National Development Bank, Board Director of Venture Capital Development Finance Company of Jamaica, Board Director of Island Life Merchant Bank and Island Life Insurance Company. At the functional level, Prof. Taylor did pioneering work and research in the fields of energy and industrialization in Jamaica, was Vice Chair of Jamaica Energy Conservation Council, 
co-managing director, Jamaica Public Service Company, and was instrumental in the establishment of the Public Utilities Commission and the Energy Management Postgraduate Program, Mona Yui. Prof. Taylor's first doctoral thesis, DBA 1983, focused on value chain and value-added development, transforming Jamaica's agro-industry through science and technology. And his second PDA, PhD, an econometric model of Jamaica's energy future, Warren Business School, Econo uh, University of Pennsylvania, 1985. He holds an MA in Law and Diplomacy, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and MA in International Business and Relations, Tufts Harvard Universities. Prof. Taylor is a Fulbright Fellow, 1979-81, an Eisenhower Fellow, 1982, and was awarded Honoris Causa in 1989 and 2012, respectively, the Doctor of Science degree by the Albert Einstein International University Foundation, New York, and the Doctorate in Public Management, BIU, Spain. Prof. Taylor is an author of five books, over 100 professional papers, refereed articles in books, professional journals, and consulted widely. He serves as Deputy Chairman of the Jamaica Tertiary Education Commission, JTEC, Chancellor of the Caribbean School of Medical Sciences, Jamaica, and Jamaica's Honorary Council in Namibia. Please help me welcome Professor Earl Spencer Taylor. Did you take my stuff? Is that my, my speech? No. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. After that summation, I think I should just take my seat. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Director of Proceedings, Advocate Graham Davis, Executive Dean of the Caribbean School of Medical Sciences, Jamaica, Professor Hardy of the Medical faculty, and all others who are here and those in the virtual space. <clears throat> Medicine has had a long journey that dates back before you and I, and the history books trace it to beyond 3,000 years BC in China. We won't go that far, um, but I want to take it from 2,400 BC, when medicine became a topic that was more general to the world. And I will come forward to 10, to 10, 10 when Ib Sina, an Arab, produced the canon of medicine. The canon of medicine. Of that huge book, five books were developed, one of which, and only one of which, was translated in English. But in, that, in, in those volumes, he discussed the substance of medicine, the treatment diseases of medicine, that concern with medicine. Uh, the formulary for medicine, and uh, they are used today 
as the foundation for our herbal and alternative medicines. Today, I'd like to thank you for turning up and for giving me the opportunity to share for some of you what may be a different perspective on your noble profession, your career choice, and your highly guarded dream or practice. By intent, it is my hope in this presentation and the follow-up discussion that it will be both instructive and provocative. And I stress provocative because as all of you know, and I don't mean those below 40, nothing happens in life positively without some progressive provocation and by extension provocative defense and I see a prominent lawyer here so she will know what I mean in law such a term invites or invokes lateral thinking critical thinking systems thinking strategic thinking thinking outside the box what some of us call now today innovation. As we meet today and speak to each other, health care reform and innovation is a very hot topic, very sensitive topic, and is being discussed in almost every corner of this globe, thanks to COVID. COVID pandemic has exposed and has even magnified the vulnerabilities and the urgency of a new transformation or agenda that was in the first place badly needed in the current healthcare systems in our country and in the globe. The challenge is to change. We have accustomed to a system and we grow to learn and accept the system without much challenge. But I will say to you today, primary health practices in both public and private sectors are struggling to survive and that's according to Vera Wallhouse Health, posted September 10, 2020, in Advanced Primary Care. And the article goes on to say that science-backed opinions and consensus are often missing, ignored or denied at the best, on the best path forward, which could strengthen through discussion and constructive engagement, our national healthcare model. Vera Wolof concluded, and not surprisingly, it says, public authorities, healthcare practitioners, and representatives differ widely on the approach they think is best. And at worst, they remain silent or neutral in the face of contemporary evidence and the continuing factual controversy. I want to use Absina's interpretation of medicine. And Absina in, pen, in 1010 from the canon of medicine says medicine is a science from which one learns the conditions of the human body with regard to health and the absence of health. The aim being to protect health when it exists and restore it when it's absent. Given citizens' legitimate rights 
and concerns with the skyrocketing cost trend in medicines, medical and healthcare delivery that's propelled to a large extent by unregulated and underregulated commerce. The prevailing and worsening dilemma demands a new approach to healthcare delivery, to healthcare funding, and the healthcare sector in general. If this sector is left to the sole dictate of commerce, when the sector becomes the domain of a privileged few, then we are heading in the wrong direction and we are in trouble. From the history of accumulated empirical evidence, medical research is by nature a very expensive and high-risk venture. Taylor, in 2015, made this observation. Uh, that's not me. It's another tailor who has distinguished himself in chemistry and pharmace pharmaceutics. And he said, done well, however, and right. It offers tremendous returns to the nation and society for a broader sharing of both risk, reward, and profit. I know and fully agree with the customary proposition that private sector interests, investment, energy, and enthusiasm are essential to drive the medical industry and processes. However, as a society's state of wellness is a public health concern and would stretch, I would stretch that to say a public good. I contend that it is in no country's developmental interest for such a national adventure to be highly injured on or captured by any individual corporation or person. Knowing this sensitivity as well as the national security implication. The technology-based and AI-driven health innovation solutions must lay at the nexus of a new and smart public-private partnership in parallel with unleashing the country's array of, and potential of natural, traditional, and alternative medicines. Done well and right, these alternative medicines and drugs do not only facilitate local value added agro-industrial production, but build citizens' income capacity and resilience to afford and withstand opportunistic diseases and other health challenges that come with age, modernity, lifestyle changes, and the like. But most importantly, that approach gives the countries participating research institutions and researchers space and time to hone their technology-aided innovations and to complete ethical evaluations in time to do clinical trials and testing to the highest level of efficacy and to win citizens' confidence unquestionably. There are a number of models that are existing in the world's health systems. Among them, the foremost practiced are the beverage model, the Bismarck model, the national health insurance model, and the last one, which is sporadic cash on demand model. I want us to quickly overview the model. Beverage model was established about 1948 by Sir William, Sir Bill William Beverage. 
a doctor himself. And the primary care health model revolves around a central point, the National Health Service in UK. Or in the case of Jamaica, it would be the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Beverage model positions government as the single payer of public health, negating most of the competition in the market in an attempt to keep costs low and to standardize benefits. As a single payer, not a player, single payer, the NHS or in our case, the Ministry of Health and Wellness would control what is called the in-network providers, those who are invited or encouraged to participate, would determine to a large extent the fees they can charge, and critically, where and how much patients can co-share costs. Outside of the UK, countries that have adopted this model include Spain, New Zealand, Cuba, Hong Kong, and even the Veteran Health Administration in the US, of course with some amendments. The Bismarck model was developed in Germany in the late or in the early 1890s by the Chancellor himself, Otto von Bismarck. And this model supports decentralized form of healthcare delivery, where employers, employers and employees share responsibility for funding the non-universal health insurance coverage through payroll deductions. In this system, private insurance plans also cover employed persons, regardless of pre-existing conditions, and such the plans are not profit motivated. So on one hand, we have a health system that is centrally controlled and driven. And on the Bismarck model, it is decentralized and powered essentially by the private sector. The third model is the national health insurance model. And it's a hybrid consisting of selective aspects both from both the Bridge, Bever Bridge and the Bismarck models. Recall that the Bismarck model is driven to a large extent by private sector, where public funds are channeled through government insurance programs to which every citizen contributes. On the contrary, the national health insurance model is driven by private providers, but the payments come through a government-run insurance program that every citizen pays into. So essentially then, the NHI operates as an universal health insurance that does not make profit or deny legitimate claims. The last model is a cash on demand where neither government nor the private sector has a key role. It is left to, to the patient capacity to afford. And as we learned a few weeks ago when CMSJ conducted a health fair in the, in the middle of the country, and when some patients were interviewed, they, they, there was overwhelming consensus that this was a needed and a timely event because as poor people in the rural area, they can manage with some squeezing to pay for the doctor's visit, but they just can't find the money for the medication. And so they leave with the doctor's advice and the medication doesn't get bought. So they were very happy that CMSJ 
was able to deliver medication, not only advice and service, but some needed medication. I want to address the issue of science-based medicine and to ask the question, are we hearing too much about science-based or is it overused or misused? And I want to quote from the International Council of Medicine, International Science Council, what it interprets as science. Science is the search and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic and methodological base based on evidence. The scientific methodology includes the following observation, measurement, and data analysis. In, in other words, science exists. We are, we are not creating science. We are scholars and students of science. Science is the search for the truth. The world was considered flat at one stage. And that was the science at the time. And for many years, people believed. Until science learned more, researchers found more evidence that the world was round. So the science changed. So we are, as scientists, we sometimes can fool ourselves. We are students, some of us are more advanced students and scholars of science. We are still searching for the truth. And to do that, we develop hypotheses. Then we develop theories. And if there's nobody contradicts them, they remain to drive our processes until we find the facts. When it becomes the fact, the truth, then that is solid science. We have learned science. And in my book, I have explained that science is driven by a number of factors, what I call the observation factors. And that is using the five senses some of us have less that God has given us. The eyes, the smell, the touch, the taste, and the feel. We use that constructively to observe. These are observe, observation points. But God has given us with three other high order senses, which I call R for reasoning, U for understanding, and I for imagination. <clears throat> I want to say that science is the deeper understanding from that model. It's, the, it's knowing with a deeper sense of confidence what we have observed, what we have through logic, through R, through logic, and re-examination, and re-examination, and re, and re we have come to a greater level of understanding, and that is the essence of science. I want to say that medicine is the same. Medicine is a multidisciplinary subject or multidisciplinary. Okay, no, no. Um, yes. It's a, it's a multidisciplinary combination um, of disciplines requiring teamwork. 
it is not it does not operate in isolation and so you have you have teams and medicine as we've come to know it over the years according to the Egyptian Imhotep describes diagnosis and treatment of over 2,000 diseases and uh, I, I want us to just the, the four point um, the next the next one The next one, the next one. Go down to the graph. Uh, yes, okay. Now, medicine has had a long trajectory. Um, we're starting in the 3000 BC, there have been huge gaps because that was filled by traditional natural medicine, plant-based medicine. So the technology was not there at the time. Um, it was low technology. And we can see, um, I did not go that far because it will not hold on this, on this graph. So I took from 1010 when Ibsen Sina wrote the canon of medicine. And here we can see here we can see the collapse in years from 1010 we see down to about 400, 450 years we see very little change and very little technology was involved in medical care delivery. Um, it sped up with technology over the last 200 years. Over the last 200 years. And uh, in 2000, there was a rapid generation of technology-driven medication and medicaments. So this is, and um, between 2000 and 2022, it has increased tremendously. It has exploded. It has exploded. Um, and the trend will continue. So this is where, at this point in the graph, we could say there was a point of transition. And this is where medicine became interesting. It came down um, to about 400 years and then we start to hear about prescription. But before that, we didn't hear about prescription. We, we hear about remedies. We hear about treatment. Prescription was an invention of the farmer, the big farmers. Um, and they, through their innovation, have taking over the industry of medicine by defining drugs and what to use when and how. So they have actually taken over the responsibility whereas the medicals used to have the ability to think, to reason, uh, to imagine, the solution, medical solution, they now just refer to the book, the Bible, 
written and authored by Big Pharma. So the concept of prescription is a comparatively, in terms of the time, a new notion in the trajectory development of medicine. It has replaced medicaments, treatments, remedies, preparations that require doctor to think deeply about healthcare solutions. They often involve diagnosis and decision regarding patient's diet, eating habits, the culture, lifestyle, family experience, social experience, nutrition, immune system and others. So medicine was not just chemistry, physics and biology, largely. It occupied a number of other fields like sociology, anthropology, even finance, as we have now come to learn how important finance is in the decision to make medicine or not to make medicine. If it's not economic, then it doesn't get done, even though there's a need and a demand. So economics has become very important. With the introduction of high technology and its increased use, big pharma and high tech and AI laboratories have intercepted the human interaction processes through big money and high lobbying capacity to be the main authors of medical prescription and perhaps proscriptions. That is, not only what you, you dispense, but what you don't dispense, like the Schedule One drugs. And worse, big farmers have managed to secure government's ear to enforce national and international law. And by extension, make doctors more mere players instead of the main players. This is the era that demoted in order and role the natural medicines, the medicines alternatives and health supplements for the average person on the street. These are critical questions and the world is at a crossroads today. Um, do we go to big or balance technology? Do we go to high technology or low technology or balance? The critical question is where do we go now? Which road must we take to make healthcare not just the privilege of a few, but accessible to all citizens? These are critical questions and point to the need for comprehensive health policy reform and a conscious transition in our healthcare delivery system. This is what I describe in my book as an eigen problem. One for which there is many resolutions, but no single or simple solution. And I want to explain what the eigen problem is. In economics, let me start with the economy. The economy as, let's take Jamaica for example, has sometimes 30 to 36 economic sectors. So um, imagine a circle that is divided into 36 segments. These are sectors. Uh, if you represent one sector, let's say agriculture or industry or mining, that would be a vector in that economy. Uh, so of all the 36 vectors, 
if you have one sector that is getting all the attention, all the funding, or most of the funding, most of the popularity, then it is said to be overheating the economy. That sector. Another example, let's say construction was booming so much that it is sucking all the funding from the bank into construction. Then you would say that construction is overheating the economy because it is depriving agriculture industry from getting adequate or getting a reasonable share of the funding that's available for economic development. So that would be so that would constitute an eigen problem. Another example we could quote let's take health the health industry and medicine is not just science based as I mentioned earlier there are other disciplines that are important to consider in dispensing a professional view or advice on a, on a patient's case. The social aspect, the nutrition, the diet, and so on. Now, we could represent the health sector in that equation. Drugs is one such vector. Then we have therapeutic medicine as another vector. You're dispensing a solution based on treatments. Then tech med. Tech med is medicine driven largely by technology. So there are doctors who are in tech med. The cardiologist, they, they use machine to determine the state of health. Um, the X-ray radiologist uses ultrasound and X-ray and MRI to determine the state of health, to investigate. These are tech med. So they, they are trained doctors, but they are specialists using technology. So tech med, um, and of course you have the GP. Now, the, the GP has been literally bypassed, but it's an important agent in the healthcare delivery because they provide family care and they have to know a lot about the social and the other things beside the normal medicine and science. They're not, they are specialists in family care. They are specialists in general practitioners business but we tend to see them as at the bottom of the ladder at the bottom of the line but they are equally important and the countries that have done well are countries that have established a good family practice and have trained at the graduate and the postgraduate level gps to handle alternative medicine to handle nutrition, health, and so on. So here we have social medicine. Then you have environment and ethical medicine. And then you have business medicine. Business medicine, the, the business the economics. When you add those A plus B plus C plus D plus E, those are eigen vectors and the solution to each of them is an eigenvalue but the point i want to make here is that like the economy if all the sectors in the economy equal zero so you add the output from agriculture from industry from education from construction from mining all of those equals zero. Zero meaning 
they are balanced. The economy is balanced. When an economy is balanced, all those sectors are perfectly balanced. All those sectors add up to zero. Then you can grow. If they're not balanced, then you're going to get minus. So it, instead of getting zero, you get minus number. And growth then gives you a positive number. So you have 1%, 2%, 3%. So the aim of the economy is to create a balanced, a balance between the sectors. So the sectors are able to feed each other, to work with, with each other. Um, and in this economy, everything is linked. Something causes and something reacts. Um, just like in medicine, you have the team, you have the nurse, you have the consultant, you have the resident, and you have the pharmacist and the social worker working together to derive a medical solution. So these are eigen problems, and if it's not balanced, if one sector, like the high tech sector, is overheating the medical delivery system, then if all the funds are going to the high-tech sector, to the AI-driven sector, then it's going to deprive the other sectors from developing and from growing and from the knowledge um, that has been produced by the AI user. So we are, we are in a direction that we have to be very careful of. Otherwise, we could end up with dummies and um, doing medicine because those that control the AI control what is done. Technology is a tool not to tell us what to do but to do what we tell it to do. And if we reach a point where technology is telling us where to go, what to do, how to do it, then we become tools rather than leaders and the main players in the medical space. So I, I want to say that medicine embodies disciplines beyond science. It looks at psychology, very important because you can treat somebody medically um, when the response should be a psychological treatment, psychiatry. You have sociology, a very important component of medicine. Just a nice smile and a caring touch makes a significant difference in a person who is sick. Anthropology, nursing, and importantly, law and economics, the legal and the ethical side of medicine. I want to just, as I come towards a conclusion, to say that there are some very interesting trends that are showing themselves. And it will continue as we go forward mergers and acquisitions. Because medical research is a very expensive commodity, a very expensive initiative. And uh, as I said, if you ask the private sector to carry the burden, then you must expect that medical cost will continue to soar. Because in every product, that they produce, there are sometimes 50 that have failed. And the, the price for this successful one has to cover the cost of those failures. Um, uh, so to ask the private sector to foot the bill would be an excessive imagination and something that should be provided. Um, and as I said earlier, the health of, of a nation is a public good. If the nation is sick, 
it affects the nation's capacity and ability to function well. And so the state has to decide in a new formula, a new model in which it shares the cost and the profit in the national interest. So what these high-tech companies have been doing, instead of going out now to labs, they're buying labs. They're buying successful and independent labs. They're merge, merging and acquiring labs. So there's going to be a shrinking of companies and a merging of companies. So, so companies are going to get bigger, some are going to get smaller, and some are going to disappear. There's what you call the patent cliffs. The patent lasts for 10 years or 20 years. But um, that payment um, doesn't last. Um, because would you know that according to the, the American Medical Association, 84% of the business is done by companies making generics. But you don't hear about them. You hear about the big pharma, the big names that control 40% of the funding. And, the, and by capitalization, they control 40%. The rest, 84% of dispensed drug in 2014 was produced by companies making generics. Because the patents have been expired, and these companies are now making it at low cost um, so that it becomes affordable. And there's a resistance. Um, and uh, generics, um, you know, a drug has a generic name that is the fundamental. And then you have the brand name. So, um, most people and they promote the brand name. I remember when I was in Geneva, I was responsible for promoting Health 2000, the, 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 the UN declaration, global declaration, Health 2000. And I was promoting generics, uh, getting big farmers to work with developing countries to co-manufacture, at best, generics, or, or at least to manufacture generics in countries. And I visited a number of countries to look at their capacity to produce generic drugs. And there were many that had the capacity. I went to the United States to test the proposition. And in those days, um, it was a requirement for the pharmacies to display a counter of generics, the equivalent to the branded drugs. It was a difficult task to find the counter. I asked, and this one didn't know, so they had to go and find it. Eventually, they showed me a counter for generics. Although it was, it was a necessary instruction by the FDA and the health authorities that generics should be equally displayed as the branded drug. Um, I say that to say that the resistance to give it equity in the promotion of drugs was, was not there. So we're going to see an increase in generic production. And countries like Jamaica should be gearing itself, negotiating to produce more generic drugs. But I want to also say, and I believe, and I said it the last place I, 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 I spoke, that there must have been a reason for Jamaica 
to change from Ministry of Health and Social Services or Social Welfare to Ministry of Health and Wellness. And the logic of this change is not yet apparent. But if we are to really be true to that which provoked, provoked us into changing the name, then we need to develop the wellness side of health. And that wellness side would look at making sure that we produce in Jamaica all the ingredients, plant-based alternatives, which have been known. They are there, they have, they have been known for years and are being used, but the stigma and the psychology that has been promoted is branded products. We need to get back and turn our research machinery, the Scientific Research Council, the research laboratories, to open those areas that we're not sure of, the scientific credibility, and to turn them into a production facility. To get agriculture moving in the space that we have, and we do not, do not have a lot of land to make huge plantation for sugar cane or banana, but we have land that is so rich and available to do exotic products like oliveira, pine, noni, kalaloo, all the immune boost building and, boost and boosting industries, and to convert our industry into producing them for market locally and export. To turn those facilities into wellness facilities. So we could be the leader in the third world in the wellness innovation industries. Um, we wouldn't need to buy and to spend so much money on synthetic drugs because that's, that's what we're, we're buying. And the amount of plant stock in it is so minute that you have to take so many and repeatedly we could turn the land that we have into a garden of Eden. There's going to be the reintroduction of what we call the green, evergreening thing, that is patents that are nearly ex extend or expired. They find some way, some way, you know, Microsoft um, used to be a, a company that offered you the product and even gave you this after sales service. Now, at the end of the, 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 the patent period, just before the end, they find something to make a small modification to extend the life of the patent. Patent evergreening. And of course, you have certain drugs that have overdone their, their period um, and they are not functioning well. Um, the orphaning of drugs. There are some developments that are taking place that would, would mind bottle you in the medical space. And today, you might hear about the brain research. There are growing brains in the lab. They are using stem cell technology read DNA. Now DNA is the, the basic foundation um, of the human system. It, it is the holder of a number of cells that control the, the human body. 
um, but they have now found not just the stem, not just the stem cell, not, not just the DNA and the splicing and so on, but they now can read even the stem cells themselves um, where there's a scratch or where there's a fault, they can read it and they're using that now to reverse age. So people are going to live longer because they have found technology to reduce and to remove and to re reverse age. So people are now going to live for a hundred and odd years. And we, we can already see that many economies are having problems because they are producing more old people than young people. And it's just a matter of time when this explosion is because young people are going to bark because they are going to have to work to carry that burden. Some of whom are already burdened at birth, already burdened by the education system and the, the debt that they are carrying. So at some point, the system will bark. We are having exciting times uh, in medical research. And I want to just share one, one, one other graph in concluding to show you how, yeah, oh, this, this one here, sorry, this, this one here, to show you what happened to medical research. Here, we have from Novartis. These are some of the big names you'll hear about. Novartis, Merck, Ellie, GSK, Bristol, Myers, Sanofa, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer. This is carried in the book sourced from data by the Society of Chemical of Chemistry, Society of Royal, Royal Society of Chemistry. And this is the type of loss between 2010 and 2012 that these companies faced due to patent expiry. Because patent was carrying them for the losses they made in trial, clinical trials and error. Novavit, Novartis, 15% of loss, down to Pfizer, 40% of loss. AstraZeneca, 38% loss. Um, now, how do you sell a company when you're making that loss. So um, government had to find some answer and COVID was one of them. Um, so they machinated an answer, but they didn't tell you how they're going to solve because they didn't want those companies to go down the drain. So they found some solution at your and my expense without telling us. This is a critical finding. And um, we have to be careful um, that we don't go more and more. Um, and that's why I said governments are getting free ride. They take people's tax and they're expecting the private sector to fund the medical bill. It's not going to work for long. People are getting wiser now. Um, uh, if the state is serious, they will apportion a piece of the national budget and also share in the benefits, the returns and the profit when it's made.
not just one company or one individual. Finally, I want to end with some recommendations. To address the, the challenge that's faced in this country and in the world, as we have seen over the last two years, we need to beef up to better public civic awareness and promotional campaigns on the proper use of medicine, drugs, complements, and supplements. The society is not a fully aware of the differences and the value of, of the various and to make informed choices. We have prescription drugs or regulated drugs or medicines and we have non-prescription drugs and medicines. We have over-the-counter drugs and medicines um, that can cater to a number of common ailments but a doctor doesn't want to write a pill for aspirin. Um, uh, so we need a f to beef up the family health, the GP, or the alternative medical um, provider. And we need to recognize them, qualify them, and make them into medicants. A doctor doesn't want to, to just go and prescribe pain reliever. Um, it's a waste of time for the doctor. And so if the community is aware of the, the do's and the don'ts, they can make better informed decisions um, and improve their health status. Uh, we need to promote World health policy, world health policy, or holistic medicine, to upgrade the content of our training system and the role and qualifications of the practitioners, to recognize them for the value they add to the profession and to challenge them to qualify at the minimum to be able to dispense their products. We need to <coughs> select and have balanced use of prescription medicines and to reserve those high-tech medicine for the specific cases that are justified. We need to increase recognition for scientific research and value-added production and the use of natural and traditional plant-based and earth-based medicines and alternatives. We need an enhanced funding for complementary medicine development. And we need more awareness about vitamins, herbal, aromatotherapeutic products, dietary supplements, and how best to use them and to produce them locally. Finally, it is my hope that when you get back home and give some further thinking to what I've said to you today, you'll be inspired 
to change a few things. Uh, to change the approaches that we take. Um, because as an institution of training, we are training minds. We are training mentalities to think, to critically examine, to diagnose. That's what diagnosis is. But not just to use the book, the prescriptions that are given to you. You have to think. You have to use what the society has always used, the street sense. I implore you, I implore you, faculty and students, and patients across the virtual space to exercise your mind know and balance your medication and to those that dispense doctors and the laboratories the pharmacists doctors need to take back medicine it is stepping from you you need to take back and i thank you Certainly, we want to thank Professor Earl Taylor on this our inaugural public lecture as he has really shown the metal of the man that he is and the information for which he has put before us today. We see where in his presentation, Professor Taylor emphasized he gave us a historical context of medicine. He provided us with the various perspectives on medicine. And he brought us to a perspective on the way forward in moving from artificial intelligence, in examining the role of technology in medicine, and in seeing medicine as a multidisciplinary approach. And we see where our Professor Taylor is impressing upon us that in our exercise of medicine that we take a holistic approach and he emphasized the need that before we had remedies and treatment and then there was a concept of prescription that changed the landscape and he's imploring us to have a balance between prescription treatment and remedies and so we want to say professor taylor it was really a very engaging presentation and we learned immensely, and we see where the role of the drug companies as well as the holistic role of governments and training institutions. And really, as he said, the way forward is that we do not take our reasoning, understanding, and imagination away from applying medicine, and not just referring to the book, but also looking at our reasoning, understanding, and imagination, and looking at not merely the science-based approach, but a holistic approach to medicine. I believe we ought to give Professor Taylor another round of applause on the in-depth <laughs> presentation that he gave us this, uh, this evening. At this point, we're at question and answer. And we know that we have persons in the virtual space, and we also have members of our audience. And so our own faculty dean, Dr. Milton Hardy, has a question for our presenter, Professor Taylor. Thank you very, m thank you very much. Are you hearing me? Yes, Prof. Well, thank you very much for a very good presentation. And uh, I have a question that has been burning me. Um, in spite of the 
poor availability and the poor uptake of vaccinations among the poorer countries, they didn't seem to do as badly in the COVID pandemic as was projected. Do you have any ideas why this might have been so? Thank you. There are many theories around that surrounds COVID. I don't want to get into them. Um, but uh, at the beginning of this trajectory, the, the countries in Africa were supposed to be um, the, the, most, the most vulnerable and the most hit. As it turns out, um, the, the uptake of the vaccination um, was very minimal. In fact, um, uh, there was a, a resistance to the vaccination um, of about 70%, over 70%. Um, those that took the vaccination were forced, either because they had to travel or they had to trade. So if you were to remove that bunch, it would have been probably, that, that resistance would have been maybe 80 or 90. The fact is that um, the poor people have always had a way to fight diseases. In fact, they, they work and live with diseases. So there's a symbiosis between the people and the, vi and the, and the viruses that are created. Uh, and so we're not sure whether um, the virus was natural or unnatural, but um, the human system has a way of defending itself and protecting itself. Um, uh, in the more developed countries, they have depended a lot on the supermarket, and I thought about this a bit. Um, the average poor person doesn't think first of the supermarket where you get all these, these fanciful food and these, these pathogens and these um, food that are cancerous and, and depleting. Um, uh, the ordinary people think about the plants, the ground, and, you know, we are, we are people from the ground. We are people made from the soil. We have zinc, copper, mercury. We have iron, magnesium, magnesium in our system. Um, and Africa has a lot of daylight and sunlight to give you vitamin D. So the, the average person is fortified internally to fight disease and they've been doing it for years. Unless it is a superimposed virus that is new and novel. But they are accustomed to, to viruses. And the human system has found a way to contend with the virus. If you can't kill it, you live with it. Um, and to generate the immune system that is necessary to protect and to defend any intrusion um, that is not acceptable to the body. So to answer your question, um, uh, most of the developing world was not affected as badly as the developed world. Now, I don't know why, um, but I'm just offering a small explanation. Thank you, Professor Taylor. And we also saw that there was some resistance in Jamaica as well. And, um, you know, I believe, I, get, I don't know why I'm not the expert here, but persons seem to have developed their own natural resistance. 
and, and their own local medicine. We have another question for you, Professor Taylor. This is from our virtual audience, from Mr. Richard Jones. And he indicates, thank you for a very interesting lecture. What are your thoughts on how Jamaica should approach the adoption of artificial intelligence in our medicine, given the growing division between the United States of America and China in its development and application? As I said earlier in, in the lecture, technology um, is there to advance, to implement science. As we learn more about the science, as, as students, as scholars, as we get more knowledge towards the truth, we are moving and technology is there to help us to achieve certain things. Uh, AI is a process. Uh, you have three Ds, you have so many processes that constitute AI, robotics. But these are tools, these are processes. And if we, as human beings, allow that process to drive us, somebody is behind those technology. If we are being used to follow the technology, then somebody is programming that technology. So we have to be careful what we use. Technology, AI, should be able to help us to quicken the process, its speed. You know, um, when you work with electromagnetic, electromagnetism, you have the electromagnetic spectrum. And as you move from left to right, from left to right, you are moving from low frequency to high frequency. Um, and what, that's, what this means, with high frequency, you generate a lot of heat. So you move from, say, radio waves, uh, you go to sound waves, you go to, to X-rays, then you go to gamma rays, and you could continue, you are generating more heat. And there is a point at which you can use the heat if it's properly focused. But you can also destroy, using the same technology, many other things that you did not intend to do. So you have to be very careful and selective in the technology that you recommend or you use. Um, I, I said, um, in this room, there is a lot of things happening that we can't see. Waves are moving like you're, you're crazy. Radio waves, um, sound waves, um, all sorts of waves. Uh, the human eye and the human, those five senses, are not equipped to hear more than a hundred sound bites or to see more than two miles away. Um, there's a limitation. Uh, but technology has enabled us to capture some of these waves. So the radio waves that are passing, we have used technology to, cap to capture those waves and to convert them into audible, hearable frequencies to convert them into frequencies that the human ear can manage. Otherwise, it would burst the ears. You have electronic energies, you have moving across, and technology has been able to capture them using innovative works to capture them, convert them. The digital te technology changed from analog to digital. Um, but before that, it was, it was tubes. We used to capture the, the energy through tubes and valves and diodes. You don't hear about diodes anymore. So AI is here to help us, not we to help AI. We must be able to master AI if it's going to be useful to us. If we are not, 
then AI will master us. It will tell you when to put the thing, so and so. Um, so we must develop the capability, the competence to manage AI. And we can produce simple things, robotics. We can make robotics to do for us what productivity requires, increased productivity. Um, so to answer that question, we have to be selective uh, in the processes that we, we, we acquire. We must master them. I remember many years ago when we had the choice to go from color television to black and from black and white to color television. The world was crazy because they went, most of the people went to color television. Brazil was not so crazy. Brazil says, you all can go color, I will take black and white. And so they got black and white technology for nothing. Whereas color technology was coming with the royalties and so on. Brazil got the black and white technology. And they were able to, for many, many years, be the only provider of black and white television. They made a fortune. They made a fortune. And that not only gave them capacity, income capacity, but they were able to understand the technology. India, for example, for many years, if, you, if you've been to India, they had four cars. A Tata, a Tata, a Tata, and a Tata. Just different colors and bigger sizes. Whereas Jamaica had 39 different models of cars from Europe, from everywhere, Germany, from US, from, from you name it. But India was smart. India developed Tata, learned the technology, the science, understood how to fit car, how to make car, how to make parts, and so on. Today, India is one of the giants in the car industry, based on four models of Tata. So technology is here to help us. We must master technology. Let's not just drive and get a fashion. Um, it will disappoint us. And adding to what Prof said, in his presentation, Professor Taylor emphasized, as he's saying, that we are to drive technology, not technology drive us. In Professor Taylor's presentation earlier, he said, technology is a tool that we tell what to do, not it tell us what to do. And so I hand over to Ms. Akeem Stennett, who has a question. Thank you again. Thank you again, Prof, for the lecture that you've been giving us. We've learned a lot. Um, my question is that you mentioned the egg and problem, but is there a formula out there that helps these gov the government, the varying governments, how to allocate the funding that they, that they use? Because I was in a meeting with um, the NHS the other day, and they were talking about funding the different chronic conditions that we're living in. And they were saying that some of them have to get more money than some. So how do they decide how they're going to allocate the funds? OK. Um, as I mentioned in my second book, um, Eigenmetric, it's an econometric formulation. It uses high maths, metrical maths. Um, uh, the economy is not linear. The, the, the models that have been that we have been using are, are production function based on production functions. You assume a, a percentage growth, and you swell the economy to grow by that amount. It doesn't work in practice. So, just like you do your budget, you say you want to get a ten percent. 
um, increase in profit and you in, improve sales and you improve cost um, by a certain margin and you get 10% profit. The economy doesn't work like that. Because when you have complex vectors where you have interactions taking place and interactions missing, you're not going to get direction. Um, and so the economy um, as an eigen problem uh, is not based on linear development. It's based on circular development. So in my, in my book and model, I model the economy as a, as a circle. And the segments are there. And if you take the tangents to each point, a, a circle is a series of, of points. And, and you can draw a straight line around it. And if you take the tangent from the center to that point, you can create a circle. Uh, but it tells you the circularity of the economy and the linkages back to the base. Uh, so in health, health is not a simple matter because it is compounded by age, by gender, by economics, by income, and a number of other social factors. Distance. Um, so you have to form an eigen problem of it and look at the various vectors that are critical to any direction. For example, just take a simple case of industry. We have not been able to, to derive maximum from industry all these years. Maybe we started in, in the 60s, but in the 70s, we have failed to derive maximum from industry because the linkages between the sectors have not been formed. Between industry, between agriculture, between tourism, we buy more of the things we need from outside than generating them from inside. And so we're not getting value added. We're not getting real GDP. We're getting GNP based on trade. So we are getting, and we are fooling ourselves when we talk about GDP. It's GNP because it is the volume of trade that we make. And at some point, GNP should be equal to GDP if the right components are there. So we are building GNP by the volume of trade, not by the domestic product that we generate to create the linkages. And we're not getting an employment because the employment that comes from value added is not taking place. And more than that, when we get a dollar, uh, the longer the dollar remains in the economy and circulates, is the more work it's done. That's one of the fundamental rules of money. You try to get money to stay as long as possible in the economy to do work. It will go back somewhere. It's a foreign investor, they'll take it back. But you try to squeeze as much to get more cycles and more linkages from the money before it gets back out. That is value added. That is creating wealth for the people in the country. There are some monies that come and they don't even touch the economy before they go back out. Those are funny money. They are fake money. You think you, you, you get a loan, so and so. That loan is to pay back a loan. It doesn't do any work in the economy. So you, you have on your balance sheet this amount of money you got. It's a lie. It is not real. It's a fake money because it has not enabled you to do any work, to get any benefit out of it. Um, so this, these are some of the things. So our health sector needs to go back to the books and to see how we can create opportunities to link health sector with the other sectors that produce um, health products. Thank you, Professor Taylor. 
That concludes our question and answer segment. And at this time, I wish to call on Dr. Milton Hardy, our faculty dean, to provide our vote of thanks. Dr. Hardy? Madam Chairperson, Mrs. Casey Jean Graham, Chancellor, Professor Earl Taylor, and guest speaker, Professor Neville Graham, Executive Dean, Principal, and Founder of the CSMSJ, our red hardworking registrar, Ms. Daniela Hyde, Administrators, Students, good evening. In delivering this vote of thanks, let us first thank the CSMSJ for the opportunity for having this lecture. And accolades are never too great to heap upon our founder and executive dean Professor Neville Graham, give him a round of applause. <laughs> we must also thank the organizing committee for putting this conference to get this presentation together. These events require the work of a lot of people, and it is extremely important that we thank them. There are many moving parts in functions like these and they have to be well coordinated. So I thank you all for being such good organizers. I must thank our chairperson, Mrs. Casey Jean Graham Davis. She's also the secretary of the CSMSJ, the company secretary, for keeping the program compact and efficient. We thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kimus Tenet, one of our students who introduced our guest speaker, she was clear and interesting. Thank you. <laughs> our guest speaker, Chancellor, Professor Earl Taylor. Well, after hearing his credentials, we could go home because we certainly knew what we were going to hear. His topic, the future of medical and healthcare training and delivery, and temptations to avoid an ex ante perspective on current trends. It was a provocative presentation, which was outside of the box. COVID has heralded a myriad of transformation in the medical arena, both in practice and training. He highlighted this. The health of a nation is a public good. In the national interest, there must be public and private partnerships and to emphasize wellness and prevention. I am sure his presentation increased our knowledge of the future of medical practice, and we thank you for your dissertation, sir. <laughs> we must thank the Shortwood Teachers College for providing these lovely and pleasant facilities for this occasion. We must also thank our videographer. I see you have returned just in time. We must, we must thank our caterers. Let us not forget them. Oh yes, oh yes. Most of all, we must thank our audience. Those here, 
and those who are in virtual land or virtual land. We thank you all for your participation because without you, there would have been no now. Thank you very much. Those of you who are on your way home, please get home safely. Thank you again. Thank you to our faculty dean, Dr. Milton Hardy, and providing us with this comprehensive vote of thanks. And it shows the measure of the man in his, even in his practice, that he is quite comprehensive and adept in anything that he puts his hand to. And it shows the competence that we have at CSMSG. Ladies and gentlemen, it was our pleasure having you. I just want to say, um, resonate again, Special thanks to our executive dean and founder, Dr. Neville Graham, to our faculty dean, Dr. Milton Hardy, and to our chancellor and our presenter for really guiding us through an interesting perspective. And to our registrar and our administrative staff, to members of our staff, students, and the continued love and support that we have gotten, and to our auditor, Mrs. Myers, who continues to support and to attend our functions. And of course, the vote of thanks did everything. And I want to say thank you to everyone for being here. And for those in our virtual audience, you have made it possible. And we say, we bid you adieu. We bid you farewell until next time. We have brought our proceedings this, afternoon, this evening to a close and say a big thank you from the Caribbean School of Medical Sciences, Jamaica. <laughs> Regrettably, those in our virtual space can't partake in the refreshments which are provided, but we do have refreshments provided. We'll send it